Welcome to Alabama Grist Mill. Good to be back. This is your host, uh, Mike Causey, with the co-host, Donna Causey. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. Been working on my uh, that book I was combining, so I've kind of been out of sync for a while with a lot of things. Well, what, bu- what book are you combining now? The, what, the Alabama Footprints, you know, I was doing the last four books and putting them all in one. I wanted to get it out before Christmas because it had the people's names in it and everything. And so I finally just sat down and I did it. <laughs> I well, got it go. done. <laughs> and so once I get it proofed and everything, it will it'll be. I'll let you know. I'll we'll mention it podcast and put it on the website and all this and newsletter. So we'll let you know. So that sounds good. Is that is that the combination book of yeah, the four? It, yeah, it's the last four of the Alabama Footprint series. I combined the first four, you know, into one book because. People want a lot of them wanted to get them get all the books, and it was a cheaper way to do it. They could buy uh, for the price of three, they get four. So, okay. and that way you have a whole big book there. And then, now I couldn't put them all in one book, so I had to just put the last four in another volume. So it'll have the last four books. So those two books in itself will have all the books so far that we've got on Alabama Footprint. Then I'm going to start moving moving on to the next book. <laughs> yep, like you, like you said, we'll let let you know via the this podcast website, all the uh, different socials we've got out there, and let you know when that's out. But uh, we got a, a story today that I found uh, it was interesting. I saw the notes uh, about a uh, a lady, uh, basically a lady, an interesting uh, character, I guess, and a lady down in uh, Roanoke, Alabama. Well, entrepreneurship was pretty good, and I think with women in the uh, early 1900s, because you know I told you about the woman with the, who invented the windshield wiper, you know, and how she didn't get that. That was a podcast in the past, but this is another woman around the same time that uh, yeah. Invented I think something. the big pro- like you mentioned before, the big problem is that you know just nobody really wrote about it back then. We it was if they did, it was you know one article here and there, but not any type of big history book and that type thing but it was in it was worldwide but she invented she invented uh and it was it had the alabama name it was called the alabama indestructible doll and they're they're still around today so you can see some it was interesting how she got started now sure, we'll put some pictures and we've got it up on the website and we'll put some pictures in the note notes of the podcast as well so you can kind of see what we're talking about here as you hear about uh this lady in alabama before we get into the story, before I let you do that, I wanted to go ahead and always mention the, our patron programs, how we keep things and keep the lights on here. Uh, you can become a member of the, become a patron, become a member of the AlabamaPioneers.com. Gives you access to uh, articles uh, first, basically. They, they do, we do open them up to public later on. But uh, you can definitely uh, get uh, early access to this, the podcast, the everything. And you know, and know that you're helping support and keeping the history of Alabama alive. We share free books too from time to time on the website too. According to the number of members, we've had several that we gave a, gave away on there. So it's a good way to get to re- get access to those books quicker and for free. A lot of them. Exactly. I mean, that's well, that's our goal system. We've got a our next goal will be 500 members. We've got a you know we're already we're right around the 400 now. We're going to make the big push to to 500. And I believe we're going to add a. We might add another little uh, goal or a little incentive on that one as well, uh, as we get closer. So we're trying to figure out the best one. Yeah. Now that I finished that other book, I have time to think about another goal. <laughs> so, like I said, it's only two of us here doing this, and so it's kind of hard to do everything at once. Yeah. So, but you can find the information about the patron program by going to the website, clicking on the become a patron button. And that'll allow you to get, see all that and get and join that up and get involved, so you'll be able to receive those the free books and the gifts things and the access that we have to the site. So as we go along, we really do appreciate because that literally keeps us going. So, and, it, and if you're unable to do that, like you mentioned with the book that you're doing, all those, of course, everything goes back into what we're doing here. I wanted you to remember too that this is the book that has all the patrons, the current patrons, as of June name in the back of it. So. We do that quite frequently to thank our patrons who support us. Well, well, that will let you go ahead and tell us a little story about uh, the uh, this uh, lady character, I guess <laughs> entrepreneur, all the above, uh, uh, out of Roanoke, Alabama, and the indestructible Alabama and indestructible doll. Okay, Ella Louise 
Vaughn Smith was born April 12, 1868, in Georgia. Her parents were Private Levi Napoleon Gant and Alpha Donia McDaniel Gant. She was born Ella Louise G, and I'm going to spell the last name because it's different on her uh, grave marker. Her, her, she was born G-A-U-N-T-T. After Ella graduated from LaGrange College in LaGrange, Georgia, she came to Roanoke in 1886 to teach at the Roanoke Normal College. She married Samuel Swains Wright Smith, who was a carpenter and a contractor. And in 1889, they moved to a house on the corner of Bain and Vaughn Streets in Roanoke, Alabama. By 1897, Ella was no longer employed by Roanoke Normal College, and she filled her days with a wide range of community activities. She often instructed art lessons for local children, and she'd make potions and poultices to soothe neighbors' ills. She was a real caring person. Being an artist, she decorated her church for local events and made artificial fruit, Easter eggs with bunnies hatching from them, and all kinds of creative activities. Ella's doll-making endeavor came about by accident after a local neighbor's child asked her to help repair a doll. The neighbor was lived across the way, and her name was Verna Pittman. She used plaster of Paris, but it wouldn't stick to the doll's face, so she pulled a stocking over the head and plaster of Paris set until it hardened. Then she repainted eyes, ears, and nose. We had to remember that at that time, the dolls were really kind of fragile. They were a improvement from the rag dolls the children had had in the, in the previous generations, but they were more like show dolls because they had really fragile heads, a lot of more porcelain. So she got the idea to make dolls more indestructible. She started experimenting with a pastor of Paris rice, trying to make it a little stronger than it was normally. At first, she just gave away all the dolls that she practiced on. But after a while, she began to get pretty good with it because she combined plaster of Paris with fabric. Everybody in town started wanting them. Soon she, her house was full with parts of plaster of Paris, doll heads, and, and material, and everything else. So her husband decided she needed to have a separate place for it. He built her a rough two-story building behind the house. That was the start of her doll factory that later employed over 12 people. After a time, her dolls were being known everywhere as Alabama Indestructible Doll. And in 1904, her representative, who began selling them for her, Frank Hornsby, exhibited her dolls at the World's Fair in St. Louis, where she won a grand prize for innovation. Being seen on a world stage helped establish a nationwide market for her product. Her dolls were also displayed at the Southeastern Fair in Atlanta, Georgia, and at Jamestown Expedition, which added to her doll's fame. She also began making other things as well as the dolls, and she received over 11 patents before she died of her innovative ideas. The Birmingham Ledger of September the 7th, 1908, believed Roanoke to be the only place in the South where dolls were manufactured. And the article stated that the yearly output was around eight to 10,000 with 10 to 12 workers. Capacity was doubling every 12 months, so her dolls were really making uh, gains across the country and all around the world. Almost everyone believed that there was a secret formula that she had because in her factory she had a room on the second floor that usually stayed locked and only Miss Ella would go in it. But her nephew, who lived with her at the time, said there was no lost secret. But she just made the heads by making police lined cloth and putting, cutting it in pattern to form the front and the back. I guess she just wanted privacy while she was painting the heads on. She was using lead-based paint at the time, so I imagine that was kind of not too good for her health. A tenth of her dolls were painted black to resemble African-American girls. This was remarkable because there were no specific dolls for African-American girls at the time. She was likely the first manufacturer to market dolls based on people of African-American heritage in the southern United States. 
the yearly output, like I said, was in, uh, around eight to 10,000 in 1908. So she really was getting taxed in her space at that time. Meanwhile, an overall company had a building that they had built a big factory, but it went defunct because overall businesses were springing up everywhere and they just couldn't handle the volume that they needed to take care of. But they convinced her to buy that old vacant building and it worked out pretty well for her. As long as the process was small and manageable and was directly under Miss Ella, the business prospered. But if she ever neglected it a little bit, it wavered. And so that was a, kind of a problem for her. But tragedy struck uh, in 1922 when two men who were her representatives in New York who went up there and were returning back with many, many orders in, from New York. Tragically, there was a train wreck, and they were killed outside of Atlanta on Sunday morning, March 12, 1922. And that was the beginning of the end for the indestructible doll, because Ella was sued by the families of the men who lost their lives, and she eventually lost her factory due to the high expenses she had to pay out. Later in life, Ella still continued with many community activities. She organized parties for the Elliott tours of Talladega and carried them all over the United States and into Canada. So she didn't quit. She kept moving after her tragedy with a uh, doll factory. A 1957 news article stated that Ella was a woman of opposites. Simple but touched with genius, great-hearted, but bluntly plain-spoken. Generous to her own hurt sometimes and devoted to children but often very harsh. As she stood alone with her large eyes, her flaring hats, and a cape-like dress that covered her like blue spark, she had a hymn-singing parrot that was perched on her shoulder. So I bet she was quite a spectacle walking down the streets of Fort Roanoke. The loss of her business took a toll on Ella, though, over the years. It really, she suffered from diabetes and kidney disease anyway. And in Ella Smith died in April 1932, so only a few years after, well, about 10 years after her business closed. About 13 years after Ella's death, Mrs. Frank Hornsby remodeled her old factory building. She kept the shape and lines and divided the building factory into apartments. But she respected Mrs. Smith, and in the grill work of the front, she placed 44 molds of the doll's head. She called the apartment house, the doll's house, as a memorial to Ella Smith. Over the years, the dolls that she placed in the grill kind of deteriorated from the weather. By 1957, the last of the heads were removed from the apartment building. Today, a historical marker stands in front of the apartment building denoting the factory that was there. The Randolph County Historical Museum Located on Main Street in Roanoke features a collection of Ella Smith's dolls, and today her dolls are quite collectible. In July 1997, the Ella Smith doll was featured in a 15-stamp collection of classic American dolls. Well, that was a really interesting uh, look at uh, entrepreneurship and uh, and uh, just a dynamic lady. I mean, she had a lot of things going on, and then Found out her niche was uh, you know, making an indestructible doll. Yeah. And I know, you know, because I know that, you know, dolls back then were very uh, rudimentary, to say the least. Yeah, they were. And, and they, you know, what you call them show dolls today, the ones that they had during that era. So it was hard to play with them and still, you know, keep them intact. And so it, it, this this really helped out. And it came from Alabama. And, but I really loved the how she was quite a character. She was an artist, and she you could, she was eccentric. You can sound sounds like with her little parrot on her shoulder and singing hymns. That I would love to hear that hear <laughs> singing parrot. Oh yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean back then, and you you didn't get a new doll every year or whatever like that. You it's 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 a long toy to play with. And they would tear up really quickly. So now I believe you is, are they still able to be seen? I think you said that in there. They you could still see a few of them. Yeah, at the museum the, at Ro in the mu at, in Roanoke, you can see some. Plus, they're collectible now. I mean, they cost quite quite a pretty penny because they're vintage dolls, and you can find them around. There's sites 
websites on it and there they have them in the library of congress and i'm sure they've got some around in alabama too at different sites if you've got one let us know you know they're really a rare thing and what i loved about it is they were called the ellis smith doll or the alabama indestructible doll so she uh, carried the name alabama along with it another unique thing out of alabama that you may have not known about <laughs> for sure you know and, it, and it, like you said it was on a worldwide scale they were famous throughout the world on the side note i always just find the older toys they just sometimes they're pretty disturbing looking you know just because they they were they were so you know, know they didn't have the, the mach- milling machines and all this that we do now the technology and everything but man, some of them. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, well, they were handmade. You know, in fact, her dolls were all handmade by twelve people. Can you imagine yeah, that? Thousands. You know, yeah. that's pretty neat to to know. And and, and that they put out thousands of them every year. It was amazing. But um, the, if you look at them, they were rough, but they were meant to be played with. It's all relative to the time, too. I mean, when you have <laughs> everything was handmade back then, everything right. was you know rough and had that little look and feel they were they were prized possessions i'm sure by many children throughout the world right and she hand hand painted a lot of them herself i think of course the mothers probably did later on in time but the original the first ones i'm sure they were all hand painted by her in her little room i guess (laughs) that everybody thought she had a private formula with yeah it's kind of like having the coca-cola formula hidden away it was like her little hidden away room upstairs but you know, in reality, like you said, she probably just wanted to have some privacy <laughs> and get away from everybody. Yeah, I imagine so. Well, with that, uh, you know, you, we just want to mention you can go down to the Roanoke and see these dolls. If we have the links and all that, we'll have all that on the uh, the podcast as well. Uh, and uh, take a chance to go take a go look a bit of history of Alabama, unique history. But uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, let Red Foley play us out with a little Alabama Jubilee. Until next time. We'll- 